Let's try something different in this discussion. To be sure, we need to review our counters and timers. I propose we do that by scratch building counters and by scratch building timers. We'll start by looking at the count up block. This block should look familiar. However, I've taken the liberty of adding the prefixes for our data types before each of the inputs and outputs. Our inputs are described as count up. This is an edge sensitive input. Every rising edge, the counter will be incremented. Reset resets our count back to zero. This is the program value. I like to think of that as the maximum count that this timer will achieve. We have the current value of the count. And this one's rather interesting. This is the previous value of count up. So internally, you could think of these two as simply being wired together. Whatever count up does, the previous value of count up will do the same. And finally, we have the Q output. And the Q output will be high when the current value has achieved the program value. To better understand this counter, let's put it into that structure that we've been using throughout class. We have our inputs as a Boolean count up, a Boolean reset, a double integer called programmed value. On the outputs, we have a Boolean Q, a double integer current value, and a Boolean, the previous value of count up. The behavior is described like this. We start with the reset. So on or when Boolean reset, the Boolean Q is assigned the value of false and the double integer current value is assigned the value of zero. So there's one. Two, we talk about count up. So on the rising edge of the Boolean count up, we have to ask a few questions. If the double integer current value is less than the double integer program value, the current value is assigned the current value plus one. So if current value is 10 and we have a rising edge on count up, current value will be assigned the value of 11. We have an else. We do nothing. In that case, we could say that the current value and the program value are the same, so we stop counting. We have another one here. If the current value is equal to the program value, the Boolean Q is assigned the value of true. One more behavior, and we describe the entire block. That's a simple one. The Boolean previous count up is assigned the value of count up. We mentioned this one already when we said that these were effectively wired together. Suppose you had a complex rung that fed into a counter. Now, suppose you needed to reuse this code on the next rung. Well, rather than repeating all of the code, you could instead simply say we want a contact from counter one dot previous current value. And what that does is it takes all of this and replicates it right there. Again, it can make your code a little more compact and easier to read.
Now that we've described the inputs, outputs, and behavior of our counter, let's open the hood and see what is underneath. One of the first things you'll notice is that there is an addition. We'll let this be our enable. This is the current value. And we have the number one. Every time this enable is true, we are going to increment the current value by one. You could think of this as a read modify and write operation. And we read the current value, we add one to the current value, and then we write current value back to its original memory location. For those of you who took a digital logic class, you could think of it this way. We have an adder. Actually, we have a 32-bit adder. That adder is associated with a 32-bit memory or a register. This is the output. And that wraps back here. And we feed in a constant of 1. This is also 32 bits and 32 bits. We'll let this register have a clock input. And the way it works is every time we have a rising edge of the enable signal, the value, which was originally here, which has come around, had an addition of 1, and is waiting right here, is transferred into the memory. So every time this rising edge occurs, we increment our counter by 1. So that's one of the pieces. There is an addition piece. There is a compare piece. We need to compare the current value of the count with the programmed value of the count. When they are equal, we can set our queue. So that's the compare function. Finally, we need the reset function. So on reset, we're going to use a move operation. And we're going to move the constant 0 to the current value. So this is on reset. On reset, we also do another thing. We reset Q. So that takes care of the basic pieces of a counter. Again, there has to be some type of addition where we increment by 1. We have to have some kind of compare operation where we compare where we are to where we want to stop. And then there has to be some reset function to put this counter back where it needs to be. Let's see if we can't put all of this together to make a functional counter. We start with our boolean count up. And we need to run that through an R trig. So that's a rising edge trigger function. And from there, we're going to a local variable called boolean count up pulse. So every time there's a rising edge of count up, we're going to get a pulse. We use that pulse in the next rung to control an adder, which takes our current value and adds 1, placing the result back in current value. The next rung is relatively simple. This is our compare rung, where we test for equality between current value and program value. If they are equal, we latch Q. The next rung is very simple. It's our reset rung, where we move the value of 0 to memory location current value and 
reset our queue. Remember that the input and output of a move instruction, those lines are connected together. The last rung of the counter takes the value, the boolean count up, and places it into the boolean previous count up. Now that we've got everything here, let's see how we did. When we have an event, when there is a rising edge on count up, there will be a pulse. If there is a pulse, we will increment the count by 1. We will read the current value, modify it by adding 1, and write it back to current value. We should add one minor change here. We will disable the addition if Q is set, which means it'll count every time there's a pulse until our current value is equal to the program value, in which case the counter will stop. It'll halt where it is. We have this test for equality where we're always comparing our current value to our program value. When they are equal to each other, we latch in Q. Q will remain latched until reset removes the latch. There's the latch right there. And again, if this is latched, we do not count anymore. We freeze the adder to whatever value it was. And this last rung just makes life a little bit easier by taking the value of count up and preserving it as an output which is available to you called the previous count up. Now that we understand some of the inner workings of our counter, let's see if we can break it in some creative ways. And one of the first things you can do is you can manipulate the current value. So that's a double integer current value. Do you remember your data types? A double integer is 32 bits. It can take on numbers between negative 2 to the 32 minus 1, all the way up to 2 to the 32 minus 1 minus 1, which goes from negative 2, 1, 4, 7, 4, 8, 3, 6, 4, 8, all the way to 2,147,483,000 to 647,647. And I very much like to put these on a circle. There's the value of 0, and here's the negative value down here. Valid numbers for your counter are in this range here. We want to stick with the positive integers, and there certainly are plenty of them. However, if you make your own code, there's nothing to guard against using negative numbers, which can create some very interesting problems. Especially if you find yourself in this range of negative numbers. So we will try to avoid that if at all possible. You should know that the built-in function will not allow you to put numbers in in this range. So while it is a double integer, and a double integer certainly supports negative numbers, it will not allow you to use these numbers, which is good news because that keeps you out of trouble. Back to our code. You'll be glad to know that it's trivial to change this into a count by n counter. For example, if you wanted to count by fives, that's all you'd need to do. By changing that value right there, you can make this go from 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. With a few trivial changes, you could turn this into a count down. So we need to change this to count down. And we'd count down by 1 in this case. We need to change the move. So it's not reset anymore, is it? It's not reset. I believe we have to change this to a value of load. 
So Boolean load. And instead of moving zero to the current value, you change this to the double integer program value. Let's see if this makes sense. So we start here on the Boolean count up. Well, that doesn't make sense. Let's fix that. So instead of calling this count up, let's call this count down. This is no longer a count up pulse, but a count down pulse. So I'm going to change it here. So count down pulse. Let's try this again. On the rising edge of count down, we'll have a count down pulse. That pulse is active on this line. It will activate our subtractor, which will read the current value, subtract one from it, and then write it back to the current value. Our comparator will take current value and compare it not to the program value, but it'll compare it to zero. If we are at zero, it'll set Q. Once set, it will stay set until we activate load, at which point we'll do two things. First, we'll move the program value to the current value. For example, if you had a counter that was to count down starting at 10, this would load 10 into the current value. The other thing it would do is it would release Q. And finally, we have this here, which is a replicant of countdown going to previous count down. So those two are wired together to save you a little bit of heartache with code. And once again, if you wanted to make this count down by different values, so maybe you needed it to start at 105 and count down by fives, you could just put a five right there and you're in business. At this point, you might be asking why? Why are we going through all this bother? Let me start by saying use the counters. Use count up, count down, and count up down as much as possible. It's what people expect, and it makes your code more readable. Allow me to couch that statement with a few ideas. First, for this class, you'll have a better understanding of how these counters work by exploring how to build your own. We could also argue that this type of thinking will make your coding in the future simpler, especially when we start making those traditional code structures such as for and while loops. Well, that was fun. We learned how to make our own counters. Let's see if we can make our own timers. This is the on delay timer. We have the inputs of Boolean in, a time called program time, a Boolean output called Q, a time called elapsed time. And then we have these, which aren't normally available, at least they're not on the block itself, but you can actually access them. So you have time, the previous date, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, and then you have this uh, reg value. Like we demonstrated in the counter, this can make your life a little bit easier. For example, if you have a large cloud of combinational logic out there, Instead of repeating the cloud here, you could simply use this value. So you would say timer on, we'll call it timer one, dot reg. Again, that would take this chunk of code here and allow you to replicate it here with minimal effort. Let's start by capturing the inputs, outputs, and behavior. Again, not much on the way of input, a Boolean in to start this, and a time value, 
known as the program time. The outputs, we have a Boolean Q, we have a time, elapsed time, we have a time, previous date, and we have a replicant of the Boolean in called reg. Our behavior, while Boolean input is true, we accumulate time in this memory location called elapsed time. Next, we have a conditional statement. So if elapsed time is greater than or equal to the programmed time, Q is assign the value of true and we stop accumulating time. So that's what happens while our input is true. While the input is false, our elapsed time is assigned the value of zero and Q, our Boolean Q, is assigned the value of false. Okay, so that takes care of input. There's two more things. Our reg value, our Boolean reg, is assigned the value of Boolean in. And this next one is probably one of the most important. The time previous date is assigned the value of system cycle date. There's a couple of things going on here. First, I've been using the word accumulate. We haven't defined what that means. And we've now got this system variable in here. And we need to understand how those come together to accumulate time. To do that, we need to go back to this familiar drawing. It's been a while since we've looked at this, but this is very important to our discussion because this describes how the PLC functions. And what we need to do is we need to focus in on this housekeeping part because this is where some of those behind the scenes functions like our system variables are actually updated. As far as our discussion is concerned today, just know this. When we reach the start of our program scan, that cold fire microprocessor inside the PLC is going to read a piece of hardware and it's going to write a value into the system variable called cycle date. It's not unlike you looking at a clock on the wall and declaring that it's three o'clock, right? It takes that value and it puts it into the memory location. As far as your programs are concerned, you can read that clock using a move statement. In fact, you could declare this the time the event occurred. Or another way of saying that is when you reach this code, the time is now. Consider this. When your program reaches this rung of code, and assuming the event has occurred, this move statement will take the current cycle date and store it into this variable called time event. This time is now. Sometime later, it will no longer be three o'clock. Our housekeeping function will diligently move the new value into cycle date. And next time your program reaches this rung, it will now be 
not 3 o'clock, but 3.05. All of this implies that we have a fairly reliable way of reckoning time inside the PLC. However, there are a few caveats. This program cycle is not exactly the most stable timekeeping device out there. It takes a certain amount of time to get around the loop, but the time that it takes to get around the loop is not always the same. You end up with what's called jitter. So sometimes it takes less time, sometimes it takes more time, which implies that we can't just count the number of loops that's occurred. Instead, we have to accumulate the time every time we go through the loop, which means we have to accumulate time every time we go through this loop. One time, it might take us 10 milliseconds to get through. The second time, it might take us 12 milliseconds to get through. If you accumulate those together, we can say once through the loop and a second time through the loop took 24 milliseconds. That's the accumulation that we're talking about. Let's see if we can clarify that a bit more. Time current minus the time past is equal to the time through the loop. That's the mechanism we use to figure out how long it took us to get through our program scan. By the way, if you want improved accuracy, there's something called a real time clock, an RT. C. As far as the Micro 800 is concerned, the real time clock is a piece of hardware. Actually, it's one of the plug-in modules that you put into the face of the unit. Hold that thought. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Anyway, this mechanism here allows you to keep track of time inside the PLC. You can do a delta time. For example, what's the difference between now and some time that occurred in past, such as how long did it take you to get around a single program scan. Let's see if we can put all this together to make our own timer. We start with the boolean in that controls a move block to capture that system variable cycle date. We'll store that value in time now. On the next rung, we'll use a subtraction operation where we subtract the past time from the time it is now. And we store that as the time it took us to get through the loop. On this next rung, we take care of the future by remembering the current time. So we take time now and move it to time past so we can use it in the future. Don't forget, we're going through this loop continuously. And every time we go through, we need to do a calculation comparing now to the past. And it's this time past that gets used on that rung. This next rung is the accumulator. So it's an addition where we take the time that it took to get through the loop and we add it to elapsed time. And we store that in elapsed time. By the way, this is controlled by in and this is controlled by Boolean in. I think I mentioned this already. We think of this as the accumulator. So as a function of time, every time we go through the loop, this value increases. And it increases and increases until the elapsed time is equal to the program time, which is our next rung. It's a comparison, greater than or equal to, and that's elapsed time compared to the program time. If elapsed time is greater than program time, we are done and we set the queue output 
now that Q is set, we need to go back and we need to stop some of these things from operating. We need to put that Q contact here and here. For the adder, we stop accumulating once we've reached our program value. And in this rung, we stop updating the time passed. And we see that up here. That's actually this variable here called the previous date. We stop updating that when the elapsed time is greater than or equal to the present time, or the program time, excuse me. One more rung, and this is complete. We need to look at the Boolean input. In particular, we need to look at the falling edge. So a falling edge trigger. And there's two things we need to do that. First, we need to move a value. And we'll move time 0 milliseconds into elapsed time and also we'll reset the latch on Q. Let me leave you with a few cautions. First, don't test for equality on type time. The reason for this is pretty straightforward. You have to remember that as we go through this loop, we are accumulating time. We're always comparing or asking ourselves, how long did it take us to get through the loop? But the time through the loop is not constant. It jitters about a little bit. You know, one time it might take us a couple of milliseconds, another time it might take us three or four milliseconds. So to guard against that, instead of checking for a quality, you should use the other operators. This will make your code much more reliable. So instead of trying to match precisely this fixed time with this one that's jittering around, you can just ask yourself, are you on this side or are you are on this side? Again, much more reliable. Another thing to watch out for is the size of your type time. Turns out it's limited. It's only 32 bits, and it counts the milliseconds. So if you put it all together, 32 bits allows you to count 1,193 hours, 47 seconds, and 294 milliseconds. And at that point, we have gone all around the circle. We've gone from 0 all the way to the max value, which is 2 to the 32 minus one. Once you do that, you wrap. So you can have a program that will malfunction once every about 49.7 days if you're not careful. That would be a very, very difficult runtime error to troubleshoot. If you find yourself in that situation, I would again encourage you to use the real time clock as it does not suffer these types of problems.